Hey guys, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Yoder, and as you can see, I'm not in my usual space today. I'm so excited because I've been waiting years to make what we're making today, and we're making pastrami beef ribs. Now the reason that this background is a lot different than where I usually film is because I actually enrolled in culinary school. Now many of you know that I moved back to Kentucky several months ago, and one of the things I really wanted to do was learn a lot more about cooking. Now I know quite a bit about barbecue, but that's about 0.01% of the food knowledge that's out there. And so there's a lot more for me to learn. For that reason, I enrolled at Sullivan University in the College of Hospitality Studies, and I'm here with Chef Beaky, and he's gonna teach me exactly how to do a pastrami brine. So today is really special for me because like you, I will be learning. Now over the years, I've done lots of beef ribs and lots of brisket, but I've never done pastrami. So chef, can you tell us what pastrami is, like where it came from? Sure, Jeremy, that's a great question. Um, actually, pastrami is one of the oldest deli meats we have on record. It dates back hundreds of years. It originally started as pastirma in Turkey as a jerky technique, where thin cuts of meat, primarily beef, goat, or mutton were salt cured and dried, air dried until it was kind of tough. Um, Romanian Jewish immigrants changed that a little bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the preferred meat in Romania was goose, so they took thick cuts of meat uh, and salt cured it, kind of getting the same end result. They moved to America and they bring with them the technology and the, the theory behind pastirma or pastrama. Uh, and as it goes, they start opening up all these delicatessens in New York. They bring with them their flavor techniques, they bring with them the, the methodologies. So they can't get goose because it's a little too expensive, but in New York at the time, beef was really cheap. Mm. So they started looking at cheap cuts of beef and the brisket wasn't selling. So they start to make the stirma mm -hmm. using the beef, but they find out with the birth of refrigeration that they don't need as much salt. So it changes to a brine. So now we have a brine cure that they can keep under refrigeration and it yields a softer product. And that's kind of the way pastrami is born. It kind of develops a little bit further and they realize they're only really targeting one market, mm -hmm. the Jewish community. And they want to kind of spread that around. And they notice that the Italian immigrants are making salamis. So they say, hey, you know what? Salami, pastrami, now we have a marketing oh, term. That's where the name came from? That's where, that's one theory or story, is that's how it gets its name. So now it's marketable, and now it kind of explodes. In today's world, we don't just have beef pastrami, we have uh, fish, salmon, gravlock pastrami, hmm. we have short rib pastramis, we've got goat and mutton pastrami. So uh, chefs today are experimenting with the concept and just changing the profile, but it really dates back to the, the early Turkish flavor profile and blend of seasonings that went on it. It gets its flavor from the pepperiness of that black pepper. It gets a citrus flavor from the coriander rub. Um, it has hints of uh, bay leaf, cinnamon, and mustard seed. Uh, and our, our recipe, we use garlic, um, and then we smoke it. And of course you get the brininess from the salt curing. Right. So we no longer have to rely on just preservation techniques because of refrigeration, but we still are driving that flavor profile that we're looking for. Right, so it's not about the need to preserve it now, but it's about pursuing that flavor that people have come to love. Absolutely, we're going back. History repeats itself. Yeah. That's why bacon was so popular. Oh, I, I do love bacon. Yeah, that's good. Now, one of the things that's kind of different about using a brine is that we use prog powder number one, and it's got an ingredient in it that's not in regular salt. So can you tell us about what this curing salt does? Prog powder, also known as Instacure, is a compound of sodium chloride, which is just regular table salt, and either the addition of nitrate and or nitrite. Okay. So in mass production, we need to make sure that, that it's free or controlled microbial hazard, and that's why we need to, to add it. In our recipe, we have fresh garlic. And fresh garlic is one of those components that in a vac seal environment or in an enclosed environment um, can promote the growth of botulism. So the pink salt, in this case, mm -hmm. Insecure, is gonna be important. Now remember, there's a difference between pink salt, Himalayan pink salt, Red Sea salt, right. um, and Instacure, because those are natural salts. They have high minerality. Um, they're pink because of where they come from. Right. This is tinted pink by the USDA standards that says, hey, 
you need to know that this is in there because it's not going to be very healthy if it's a high concentration. Right. So you wouldn't want to use it in place of table salt or something like correct, that. Correct. Correct. Okay. We can, and we are seeing more old world style curing. You know, the trend right now is the hmm. uncured products. Like uncured bacon, things like that? Uncured hot dogs, uncured bacon. You're absolutely hmm. right. And what that's doing is it just refers to the absence of this compound. Okay. It's not no nitrates and no nitrites because sea salt has, a, has trace minerals. Right. So if you're using pure sea salt um, and it has trace amounts of nitrate and nitrite. Right. And we add to that things like celery juice powder, which is high in nitrates and nitrites. Oh. Therefore, it is natural, oh, okay. so it's uncured. It's kind of like playing a game a little bit. Yeah, it's a twist on the words like we do in this industry. Mm. Let's see. Well, that's fascinating. So let's make the brine, uh, see what all goes into it, what's the process, and uh, let's get some ribs brining. And we're going to include a recipe for you guys in the description. So if you're interested in trying this yourself, you can check it out there. But first we have water. I can identify that. Mm -hmm. Looks like salt. Salt. The Instacure, so product powder number one. That's correct. And then what's that white powder? That is dextrose, powdered dextrose. It's, dextrose. it's a little bit finer. It breaks up and dilutes a little bit easier. Um, in this environment, we don't have to worry about the, the granules breaking down. It's, it's nice and evenly dispersed. Okay. So this is superior to if you had table sugar. You wouldn't want to use table sugar. You'd want to use dextrose? You could use table sugar. I mean, there are some chefs using honey okay. or sorghum. In, in their recipes, they're using molasses. So any sugar derivative, I just find that it breaks down a little bit easier for this because we inject it. Uh, oh, okay. That makes sense. And then garlic and what's that spice? Oh, this is cool. This is pickling spice. This particular blend uh, mimics all those flavor profiles from the Turkish origin. Oh. Right. So we've got cinnamon sticks, we've got bay leaf, we've got mustard seeds, we've got juniper, uh, we've got some clove. It does change slightly depending on the chef. I kind of make this one based on the flavor profile I'm shooting for. Right. So it's just strange to me how it developed so much from, you know, people trying to preserve meat in Turkey and then uh, Jewish immigrants moving to places like New York, they're doing their pastrami there. And then for me, I'm a barbecue guy, and I'm like, I look at this pastrami at Cat's Deli and I think, you know what, I gotta get some of that, or if I can't get some of it, I have to make it. And so it's really fascinating, the history of this and the ingredients that go into it, and I'm really excited to try it. How do we put these together? It's pretty straightforward. It's just this, like the, I refer to it as the straight dough method. Everything goes in okay. and away it goes. Does the order matter? No, it does not. Okay. Because the, the blender is strong enough to break it all down. Okay. That's the beauty. And why do we do it in a blender? So we break it all down. Uh, now, depending on the thickness of the meat that you're going to cure and whether or not it has bone structure, all plays into the curing itself. So okay. we normally would, would cure a, a brisket, which is pretty thick and pretty right. large. So we would want to inject some of this brine into the muscle to speed right. up the process. It's only going to sit five to seven days. Right. So if it has a bone, we want to inject some of that brine next to it. If it is got a it. dense muscle, we want to inject it to speed it up. Okay, got it. Okay, so I got it all in here. Let's see. They got a little carried away or else I didn't put this lid on well enough. But is that kind of what we're looking for? That's it. I mean, it can go a little longer to break it up, but that, that's all you got to do. Really okay. straightforward. And then we add this to the remaining water mm -hmm. and place the meat inside it. If you need to inject, then you can use some of this liquid to inject. That's what I do. And then I pour all of the rest on top and then just let it sit for five or seven days. Now we can speed it up okay. if you put it into a vacuum environment. Uh, okay. Because what happens is we could take this little bit of brine and if we had a big enough bag for our meat mm -hmm. in the vacuum process, it expands the muscle and allows the gas to escape. And when it makes the vacuum, it sucks all that brine into the muscle structure as it creates the vacuum and uh -huh. seals it all in okay. in an anaerobic environment. And that right there is one of the main reasons that we want the curing salt because it's anaerobic and garlic is in the bag. Right, so we want to avoid the anaerobic bacteria, things you like that. It. Okay, so we're going to take this and we're going to add it to some more water. So we only use part of the water that's necessary because there's limited space in this blender. 
and we want to just get a really even consistent product here and then add it to the water to distribute it around. We're going to place the meat inside and let it sit five to seven days and if necessary, if it's really thick or if there are bones, you can inject. So let's get those beef ribs and get them ready. Nice. I did a test once where I cooked choice, prime, and wagyu and the choice was the best. Do you know why? No. Just everything, all the impurities that you're used to eating. Oh, really? Yeah. It depends on the feed. It depends on the connective tissue. It depends on where it was grown. Everything, how it was finished. So probably the choice was probably more in line what you're, you're used to or what really? you ate most of your life. So here we have our beef ribs and if you don't already know, beef ribs are my absolute favorite barbecue meat. And there are a couple reasons why. Number one, there's great marbling in beef ribs. Number two, there's some connective tissue in the beef ribs, which is going to hydrolyze and form gelatin. Now, the idea of meat jello might sound gross, but trust me, it is absolutely delicious. So we want to trim this up to get it ready for the smoker, and then we're going to put it in the brine. So here we have silver skin, and that's gonna prevent smoke penetration, and it's gonna limit the kind of bark that we can achieve on the outside. So I'm gonna get all meat all over the top, and there's so much marbling and so much connective tissue that this won't dry out, even over the course of a 12-hour smoke. So that's all the trimming I'm gonna to do to these beef ribs because I wanna expose as much meat as possible because that's where I'm gonna build that bark, which is the flavor that you're going after when you barbecue. That's the whole reason you barbecue. You could get something tender in the oven, but the smoke flavor that you get with barbecue, you need to get on that surface. Now, I didn't do anything to the backside because over the course of a 12 or 14 hour cook, these can kind of break apart and you get the bones falling out. I need this membrane to hold it all together. Also there's a layer of fat that's gonna keep all the meat inside extra juicy. With this guy ready to go, let's get it in the brine. Okay. So does the container matter for this? Uh, we say non-reactive. Uh, it could be stainless, it could be plastic. It, we just wanna kind of alleviate any issues with any outside aluminum contaminants. Right, and so that, no leaching. Correct. Okay. We don't want any, anything that could happen. Okay. So we're controlling everything we can through the process. Got it. Okay, so meat side down, you think? That works for me. Okay. Good, or just cover it. So normally you'd have to wait five to seven days for the brine to penetrate deeply enough, but we've already brined some beef ribs beforehand, so we're gonna take those out and get them seasoned with the rub and get them on the smoker. All right, Chef, what do you put in this rub and why? I use 50% black peppercorn, 50% okay. coriander seed. Uh, so it's in line with the true purpose of the flavor profile. We have the pickling spice in there already. So that underlying flavor is developed. Now we need a bold upfront flavor that's gonna blend with the smoke. Mm -hmm. So we get the citrus from the coriander, we get the spiciness from the black pepper. It's not technically spicy, it's technically just sharp okay. because there's no capsaicin, it doesn't hold right, on. Right, right, right. <clears throat> And then once we get that and the saltiness and you get the smoke flavor and it just it just melts together. Okay, great. And how heavy do you usually go with this? I, I like to go fairly heavy. Okay. So why do you want it wet? Why don't you want it dry? I want it wet because I want this rub to stick um, because a lot of it's gonna fall off during the smoking process. And so the more I can get to stick on initially, the better. So if this were a completely dry surface, yep. a lot of this rub would fall off, and I don't want that because this is the flavor I want to build on the outside surface. Cool. Do you season the bone side also? I do not. I just don't think the spice is penetrating. Do you do something like that? I go heavier. Heavy, okay. I'll go your way. Like that? Good. Okay. And then I always get these edges because any exposed meat, I want to season. And we're not adding any salt because we've already gotten the salt in the brine, right? That's correct. Okay. Is there a need to desalinate uh, by soaking in just plain not, water? Not for this purpose, because it's only five to seven days. It's not, it, we don't have a whole lot of equilibrium. 
you know, we're not necessarily looking for the, the salt myoglobin exchange to be completely throughout the whole thing. Okay. We're just trying to preserve it under refrigeration. It's not going to be dry cured. It's going to be under a hot smoke environment. So we're okay mm -hmm. at this point as far as safety is concerned. Alright, All right, so here we have this rub on the outside surface. This is going to be the foundation of the bark. Now it's our job to add to it with good smoke flavor. back inside and we've let this rest for two hours, which I'd like to let it rest for even longer, but two hours is good enough. And so let's see how it turned out. So why do you rest in paper? So we use the paper because the paper's still a little breathable. So if you use aluminum foil or something like that, um, it's steam, right? yeah, you steam it and then the bark can kind of get soft and kind of wash away. So the paper kind of mitigates that, but still provides protection. Hmm. All right. It smells good. Now, hopefully it tastes good. Let's uh, cut it open and see. Beautiful. Looks pretty good to me. Nice color. Juicy. Yeah. So lots of moisture still in there. So the brine penetrated the bottom too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, chef, would you do the honors? Oh my gosh. We better be hungry. Oh, clean bone. That's beautiful. Go ahead. All right. Do it. All right. Let's cut off a couple chunks here. Okay. Let's see. Golly. It's tender enough. It's juicy. I mean, there's so much juice in this. Like, I could make this drip juice if I squeezed it enough. Yeah. It's just insane. Well done. And I'm really, I'm really curious to see if that red color is gonna result in different flavor. That's mm. my dot. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, dude. That's, that's really good. That's fantastic. <laughs> I need more. Yeah. I get the pastrami flavor. It's not overpowering though. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be overpowering. It's good. Wow. This would make the best sandwich of all time. Mm. I feel like we'd almost be wasted on a sandwich. Get that little bit of citrus from the coriander. Yeah. It's good. Nice. Yeah. It's probably gonna add a lot of black pepper just on the outside there. Mm. I feel like you get a clearer smoke flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, you get the beefy flavor yeah. and then it's supported by the sweetness of, of just everything that's around it. That's, that's wicked. You know, for a long time, I thought that, you know, barbecued beef ribs were the pinnacle of barbecue flavor, that you couldn't go anywhere beyond that. I think these took it to the next level. So I wouldn't want to replace beef ribs with this, but I definitely will be making these again. It's just like it takes the flavor of beef ribs and you turn up the volume, you add some more flavors from the dry brine. And to me, it's like magic on a bone. Absolutely. There's nothing that says you can't adopt it or change it right. or add some of these these techniques and methodologies to your ribs mm -hmm. from now on just to kind of build that tastiness or just kind of bring it up to the next level. Right. So the, I thought I would not like the coriander rub because you, you, you grind it up, you smell it, it smells kind of like citrus. And I thought I've never put anything like this on barbecue before, but actually it complements it so well. You, mm. you kind of get it 
as one of the layers. So you have the black pepper, you have the smoke, you have the brine flavor. To me, it's, it's just a nearly perfect piece of meat. And now you know why it's been so popular for hundreds of years. Right, and why people are gonna wait in line for hours at Cat's Deli to get one of those pastrami sandwiches. That's right. So there's nothing stopping you from doing this at home. Like I said, the recipe is gonna be in the description. This is 100% worth your time. You're gonna be glad that you did this. And after you do it, you should make yourself one of those piled high pastrami sandwiches. And you're gonna be so satisfied. And it's gonna be something that you're not gonna be able to get at the local deli. I'm so glad that I got to do this today. I wanna to thank Chef Beaky, I wanna thank Sullivan for letting me film here and letting me gain knowledge, learning new things about barbecue that I'd never learned before. This is really cool. Uh, thanks for having me on your channel. Uh, for sure. I'm for sure. glad that we can share. Uh, food's a universal language, really. Right. So anytime we can do this, this is really awesome. Yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed it. But if you guys enjoyed it, hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'll see you guys next time.